Hello everyone, this is our group run presentation. So we start with introducing our fellow members. This is me, Yun Ling, Brian Cho Kin Ho, Chan Ke Yi, Jack Kwan Li Ying, Keshvina Gengarajan, Koshalavani Nadaraja, Priti Alsevan, and Tan Li Yu. So we start with our first presentation presenter, which is Priti, who's going to tell us about Ivan's marriage rituals. Hi guys, my name is Priti, and today I'm going to present about marriage ritual of Ivan. Okay, there are a few things we should know about marriage ritual of Ivan. So the main reason Ivan marriage is they love to raise many children to continue their to continue their descendancy, which is called Peturun. Okay, so let me explain about Peturun. So Peturun means to acquire more land and wealth. Perhaps they multiply in numbers as a natural defense against enemy tribes. So for the marriage ritual, so the marriage ritual, the religion belief or we can call as God of creation of Iban is Slam Pandai. So why Iban have belief in Slam Pandai? Because of fertility and reproductive and they, the praying ceremony of this God of creation is by offering tuak, which is rice wine and tumpi called as rice cake. So we move on to the next one is the proposal. After parents boy from site from boy side choose suitable girl they will send message confidently we are relative choose one with the parents and the close one with the parents is because to avoid embarrassment in case the proposal rejected for both parties so the message they will send is called as kajaku, which means literally reveal the desire or intention or beribut kajaku to bring win news other than that when come to when come to the marriage there is some engagement and gift for the guai and or ngui which means married woman or man decide to move out and live at their spouse home so we can give them lumpic para known as silver grinder or baku temaga a brass container and so on after the mela pinang are finalized after the mela pinang are finalized we will move on to the wedding ceremony so few weeks before all the relative they will extend invitation to relative and friends so if they follow the traditional way they will send they will send it. They will send invitation was in the form of Tamuka Dali, which is string knots. So during the ceremony day, bridegroom and his party go to the bride village. So the journey by boat. And they will beat the gong and drum, which is called as Batabo. So the purpose of Batabo is to avoid hearing the cry of bad omen. So the bad omen we can call as Jai Burung. So Jai Burung is similar to Eagle. So after that, they continue the journey to the village and people in the bright long house and their guests coming, they will fire guns, welcome the guests. So when it comes to the boys party, they will return the gun salute with equal number of gunshots, proceed to the longhouse where they are invited to open a kuta, which is an artificial stockade. And kuta is open, the guests are led in a procession along the ruai. So during the ceremony, begins with the session known as Nyanya Kabarita to inquire for news. Initiate by the host for the guest fair, as both speakers from each side will give their speech mostly in classical Iban, the family. So when it comes to the families, they introduce their relative to each other. And in Iban, it's known as Adat Ber... Wait. Adat Berisan. 
and merry making commences with a lot of food drinks and entertainment of traditional so we will go to the blessing ceremony so blessing ceremony usually they will call as the, the baby yo ceremony so the baby yo ceremony is which is all of the both side of family from the boy side and girl side members will dress in traditional so this ceremony usually they will follow traditional way and they will bless newly married couples and they will do a, some praying ceremony in that which the lembabang uh, which is known as bad performs the baby of ceremony by holding and waving the the cock over their head and reciting his prayers of blessing and they end their prayers with saying gayu guru celap lindap gerai nyamai lantang sena so what it mean is was a long healthy tranquil cool content and comfortable life so as we can see iban mary ritual is some kind of really they follow strictly traditional way and their unity is really strong so thank you that's all from me thank you very much priti for such a wonderful presentation so let's welcome our chan kyi who's our next speaker that is going to speak about fest the festivals of iban Hello everyone, my name is Ke Yi. Today, I'm going to talk about Iban Festival. The traditional of Iban Festival include Hombil Festival, Gratitude Ceremony, New Year Eve, and Carnival Festival. First of all, I'm talking about the Hombil Festival. The Hombil is a particular and large bird with a long beak and black body and colorful crown. It is regarded as a divine bird by the Iban people and used regarded a, as a good. It is believed a good harvest can be obtained with the protect of the Hombil. The Hombil festival is as known as the harvest festival. The festival has no fix and is usually held after harvest of the grand. People wearing gold and people wearing gold and silver jewelry gathered in front of the altar to take part in the grand sacrifice ceremony. Second, I will talk about gratitude ceremony. The Iban gratitude ceremony is actually similar to Hanbil festival. The difference is, the, is that the Hanbil festival is held after the harvest and gratitude ceremony is held before the harvest season. The Hanbil festival is to thank the Hanbil for their treatment. The, Sanctuary and the Gadidio ceremony is to thank the good. The Gadidio ceremony is also a traditional farming ceremony of the Iban nationally, which aim to celebrate the harvest and to give thanks to the good. At the time, the priest will preside over the ceremony. The heat of longhouse lead to village to give thanks to the good. At the end of the ceremony, the women sang their stickers to cut the rice ear back to the longhouse. The elderly woman waiting at home delivered her tea and sheet wine to those ha who had returned home. Third is New Year Eve. Every year on May 31st, 31 first, it is traditional festival for the Iban people in Sarawak, Malaysia to say goodbye to the old and welcome new. On New Year Eve, the long half chef will lead all residents to hold the grand festival. At 8 o'clock in the morning, two pigs were killed in the human hit house and the pig blood was 
distributed to each household. At the night, every household in the longhouse has to send one person to sleep in the head house. They, to, play, to pray for the lonely self of the human head to protect the whole family and exercise courage. Last is the carnival festival. The carnival festival is also traditional festival of the Iban. And it is also the designated as a national public holiday by the Malaysia government. The carnival festival also need to do a lot of preparation work such as making coconut wine, all kind of cake, cleaning, decorating the room. One the day of carnival, the Iban people will invite friends from all ethnic groups to the long house to celebrate the festival. The housekeeper will first preside over the traditional ceremony to pray homage to mountain good and ghost. And then the various in Iban various customer will take take turn to jump up here at war dance. Iban people also singing and dancing and drinking coconut wine. People also perform a unique dance, the various dance, the dancing bites the mortar with his mouth and lift it to show his strength. The day is the most important mirroring ceremony in the festival. The priest and elders will lift up a white and red cord, swing and back in front over the girl's head and recreate the mantra of prayer in order to pray the mountain good and God to bless you. Thank you. The above is all about the traditional festival of Iban. Okay, thank you very much, Kui, for such a fast such a wonderful festival information about Iban. So let's follow on with Jamie, who is going to talk about traditional costume. Hi, I am Jamie. Today, I want to present is Iban traditional costume. Let us look at the Iban traditional costume for women is Mary Embang and Kain Kebat. Mary Embang is a combination of beans and hand-stitched cotton decorative outer garment and it is red in color. They wear Mary Embang at any occasion or festival. Traditional Iban, traditional Iban dance performed by Iban women must wear the Mary Embang and the second of Iban traditional costume is Kain Kebab. Kain Kebab is a cloth pattern by the Ikat technique. It is decorated with colorful strap pattern design and it is made of cotton. It is narrow and its length is only about until knee. And here is the picture of Mari Ambang and Kain Kebab. Okay, the next one is Iban traditional costume for women is Kalambi and Syriat. They have two types of Kalambi, which is self and sellers. It worn by men during certain ceremony. Its cutting is very simple, which consists of a rectangular piece of cloth foot double. Syriat it with a very long logging cloth around the waist and between the two stocks, there should be a tail in the back. And this is a picture of Kalambi and Sirat. And also this is the method that how to wear Sirat. And thank you. Oh, wow, that's really, really cool and interesting. Thank you very much for such a wonderful presentation. So our next speaker, Ryan, will be telling us about the traditional food of Iban. Hello, guys. My name is Brian. And now I will be presenting. I will continue my speech with traditional food for Iban. First of all, 
This is Kasam Ikan Iban. It's a very delicious food in the Iban country. This food is an orange flavored food for Iban because this is second best known orange meal. While cooking this food, many, many fish can be picked up before it become orange flavored food. But the fish will be married with certain herb for a month. The only then only can start to cook for kasam ikan iban. Next, this traditional food is terung iban or called terung asam. Basically, it is used in fish soup, curry, and sausage. Why they using this to cook? This is because it can use as substitute for tamarind. Let me explain more about tamarind. Tamarind can provide a compre comprehension examination of the most important aspect of tamarind, biology, cultivation, and use. Mostly even we'll use this to cook a asam pedas, sour on, or spicy dishes. They also use it to make samba. Nextly, this food called pansu ikan is this is the one of Iban favorite food. They can eat this food in any time they want because it's easy to cook. First, mix the fish with the powdered esso and ajonomoto to taste it. Next, insert the fish into the bamboo, then Stuff some potato leaf on the surface of the bamboo. Lastly, turn off the heat and simmer until cooked through. This is a special dish that Iban community may when Gawai diet is coming. Okay, next this food is Manu Pansu. It was a bamboo known as grass. It's repackaged inside it. It mostly is using chicken to insert into the bamboo. This dish is suitable for eating with white rice. The origin of ayam pansu is unknown as well. Manu pansu is prepared during festival. Okay, after representing traditional food of Iban, I will continue representing traditional kue of Iban. Traditional kue is also very delicious than others. Many people will like it. First, this triangle-shaped kue called kue sepit. To make this kue, the flare is using sagu flour of slate. But why is using sagu flour or slate? Because this will make it more durable, crunchy, and resistant to cold. Next, this traditional kue is penyaram. This kue, hmm, Ivan is making it as some available for certain obsessions such as congregation and happy thanks giving concert. Of course, Panyaram also was sold and made as a commercial in the business. Another from that is Sarang Samut. If you didn't hear that Sarang Samut before, maybe you heard this kueh is important food to serve during Gawai diet celebration. Lastly, this traditional food named Chuan. This name also varies by region when was the kueh. Mostly can see it can be seen on Gawai Daya. Of course, this kueh is served to guests when Christmas Eve and other festival. I'm done for my presentation of traditional food and kueh of Iban. Hopefully can let all of you more of work of traditional food and kueh of Iban. Thank you. Oh, wow, that was really yummy. All right, so our next speaker will be Kashfina, who is going to talk about the language of Iban. Okay, hi. Um, today, I'm going to show you my slide that's about Iban language. So moving on to the first. Okay. Um, introduction of language. Iban is a language. Um, Iban is a language of about third of the population in Sarawak, and it is used as lingua franca. 
linguist Fra Franska even has said uh, most of the linguists who did a study on a language said that Iban is a Iban is a homogeneous language language. Um, okay, coming to homogeneous language, what's the meaning of that? Okay, it meanings of um, family language. So homogeneous language is a family language. There are few few difference between area of settlements and most differently um, ascent. Furthermore, there is no barrier or difficulty difficulty of understanding between them. Okay, my first slide, the main slide. Okay, there are three points of Iban lang uh, main uh, language. The first one, Iban language, that is Jacob Iban, is spoken by the Iban of branch of Daya and Tanik group who lived in Brunei, the Indonesian province of West Kalimantan. And second point is, uh, the second point is belongs to a Malay language, a Malayo Polynesian branch of the Austronesian language family. The third point, Iban has different ethnic groups, example Sarawak, such as Ramos, Balaus, Seb Sebuyas, Ulaai, and Rajang. Okay, looking at this slide, Brook era, who is that? Okay, during Brook era, Iban language was used for a communication between the Raja and his people. Um, Brook era, the Raja used this, used this language to deliver a government policy. Apart from that, Iban was used by the missionaries to spread Christian, Christianity among the Iban people. Besides spreading the religion, the miss, missionaries also built schools in the rural areas. Iban became the medium of an infrastructure in this mission school that is called SKST for Banting in 1853 was the first school to use Iban language. A C Dayak dictionary was written by Ref Peter Howell and Graf DJ Bailey in 19,000 to help the teachers as their source of reference. Okay, looking at this slide, it's another person called Colonia Era. So during the Colonia Era, era Iban language was introduced through the radio of Sarawak in 1955. Oral, oral literature was recorded and area through the radio of Sarawak. Later, the language was introduced under the Asian study, that is Sarawak Junior Cambridge exam in 1957. The information of Bruno literature Burial, that is in the short form, they will call it as BLB, helped in a development of Iban literature in 1958. Then later in 1963, the language was approved by the Sarawak Legislative Council as a subject to be taught in school. In school, time allocated to teach this subject was minimum two hours per week. Okay, look, looking at this slide, this table. Okay, um, I don't want to go too further about this table. So I'm going to ex explain to you two in English and in Balau, that is Sarawak, and Mulang, that is Kalimantan. Okay, the first one, smell. Okay, um, in English, we call it a smell. And in Balau, we call it a new, that is Sarawak, in Sarawak language. Uh, then in Mulang, that is in Kalimantan, we'll call it as Lulu. And the second, I'm going to say in English, is the window. So Balau, we'll call it as Penginga. Mulang is Telingu. Okay, looking at these numbers, okay, um, this is the numbers that mostly Iban, pe no, Iban people are using to talk about this language. I mean, they are their own language that's seven, 790,000 people 
are speaking this language. So it's a bit big number. So moving on to the next slide. Um, there is a sample process. So there's a, there are five, I written the five, but I'm gonna at least tell you two of it. So let's, okay. I'm gonna start in English. Where are you from? So in Iban, we'll call it Ari, Ari Ni Penantai. And the second one is welcome, is called as Selamat Datai. So that's end of my slide. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Kashrina. So now following on, we'll be talking. Um, um, hi, my name is Jack. And today I will be talking about uh, the universe Unity in diversity. Unity in diversity is an important aspect for national development as it shows that no matter what differences anyone has, they could stand together and work through it. Trying to unify all the diversity in a nation is difficult. Oh shit, oh no. <gasps> I'm, I'm sorry, okay. Trying to unify all the diversity in the nation is not an easy task as there were always found to be obstacles to national unity as racial discrimination towards different races, which may lead to violence. Children, children in school may be... Oh no, oh. can I restart? Uh? I'm so sorry. Uh. Yeah, yeah, you can, you can, don't worry. I'll just cut this out, don't worry. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh. If you guys want to restart, you can also tell me because um, I probably will cut out a lot and then if I notice that the slide and everything is not right, I'll probably ask you guys to redo, not redo, like just cut out not important stuff, okay? All right. Hi, my name is Jack and today I will be talking about the unity and diversity. Unity and diversity is an important aspect for national development as it shows that no matter what differences anyone has, they could stand together and work through it. Trying to unify all the diversity in the nation is not an easy task as there were always bound to be obstacles to national unity, such as racial discrimination towards different races, which may lead to violence. Children in school may be bullied or harassed just because they are part of the minority. Moreover, the citizens in the citizens will usually form a group of party to avoid meeting and mixing different races where their individual culture is unlike from them. Even though it is not assigned by the government, the citizen will designate different areas with different races. With so many religions and cultures, sometimes their actions and beliefs may offend one another. For example, it is disrespecting to point your feet so at someone in many cultures, especially in Muslims. Additionally, there will always be biased feelings towards their own race, which happens a lot in workplace. The majority would gather and dominate the minority, preventing them from achieving success and taking control in the workplace. Due to all the harassment towards them, the minority group will lose their cultural distinctiveness over time and slowly acquiring the culture of the major com community and finally becoming part of the majority group. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Jack, for such a wonderful presentation. So our next speaker in Yuning will be speaking about the, in the national development that government provided, such as education, infrastructure, economy, and medical care. So one, one of the biggest aspects of national development is infrastructure. Infrastructure plays a big role in economy, boosts the productivity of private capital and labor, which leads to a higher output. Malaysia government made considerable efforts and large investment in expanding its highways, railroads, sea parts, and also airports. Malaysia also used to promote the development of aviation in order to serve growing tourism and business industry. More recently, government also played an active role in encouraging development of modern modes of communication due to our current pandemic, COVID-19. One of the 
development is satellite telecommunication and internet. Moreover, in response to the gaining number of cars on the national roads, the government invested in developing a public, public transport system, including modernization of countries' railways and the construction of light rapid transit system, which is widely known as LRT. So what are the benefits? The benefits are reduced in air pollution, the reduced in forest fires in Indonesia, which also reduced the risk of creating hazard smoke. A little fun fact though, do you know that our Malaysia's total highway length is actually longer than the Earth's circumference? Isn't that really cool? So yeah, um, so we we'll continue on with the economy. Economy also plays a big factor in national development. Let's look here, the new economic policy. The current economic policy mainly favours ethnic Malays, which makes up a significant part portion of country's population. This is evidenced by the new economic policy introduced in the 1971. It is widely believed that the new economic program, known as NEP, helped Bumi Putra escape poverty. The graph here shows that the monthly income of Malays has increased significantly compared to that of Chinese and Indian Malaysians. Yeah, as you can see on the graph here. Continue on. Education. Over the period of independence, education has been system systematically estimated by stages, with governments emerging goals at national developments. The initial trials of 1957, policy reforms focused on the primary level of education, and particularly on the historical sensitive matters of language and curriculum. In reshaping the heterogeneity of the past, primary schooling it was con reconstructed into an educationally integrated whole having linguistically separate parts. Each of it has its own language stream and its own instructional orientation, as you can see on the below table. Since early history, Malay education was perceived early on its term of agrarian and peasantry, while Tamil was Tamil school was geared to its consistency of an immigrant plantation. English medium followed the grammar school type. And finally, the Chinese schooling was directed in recreating the literature of the classical tradition of China, which is known as Guwen. And that's basically the whole summary of my slide. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Ko Koshalavani. Hi everyone, my name is Koshalavani. Uh, today I'll be presenting about national philosophy. And on 13 May of 1969, um, Sino-Malay Sino sectoral violence incident took place in Kuala Lumpur, Selangor, Kuala Lumpur. The riot occurred in the aftermath of 1969 Malaysian general election when opposition parties made gains at the expense of ruling coalition at the Alliance Party. Official reports put the number of deaths during the riot were 169. Although when the Western diplomatic sources uh, found out that there's actually more deaths, which were 600 deaths, and most of the victims were Chinese. The racial riots led to declaration of a state national emergency, or it's called Darurat, by the Yang Di Pertuan Ago, resulting in the suspension of parliament by the Malaysian government. While the National Operations Council, which is the NOC, also known as the Malaysian Majlis Gerakan Negara, was established as a caretaker government to temporarily govern the country between 1969 and 1971. As you can see, here are the example of pictures. Thank you very much. That's all for my presentation. Okay, thank you very much.